Revelation chapter 9 in your Bibles. We're going to pick up where we left off last week, and we're going to start here in verse number 11. Revelation chapter 9, verse 11. I want to show you some things. We're going to read the rest of this chapter together, and we'll pray, and then uh, then we're going to get into it here tonight. But uh, I want to look at something here and show you some things. We're going to compare Scripture with Scripture. And uh, what we've got tonight, what I'm going to show you tonight, if you're not careful, you'll miss it altogether. So I ask you to turn to the verses as we turn and look at them. And when I pray here in a minute after we read, I want you to pray and ask God to open your eyes that you may behold wondrous things out of his law, like David prayed. And I think the longer you're saved and the longer you study the Bible, the more you realize how desperately you need to pray that. Amen. Uh, you could be like uh, could be like Todd and Sarah's son. And they said, we're going to go to church and have some quiet time tonight. And his response, Wesley's response was, we're going to have quiet time and Pastor Mike's going to be real loud. Amen. (laughs) You could come to church and just hear nothing but a real loud preacher. Or you can come to church and learn some Bible. Amen. And tonight we're here to learn some Bible. But listen, you're going to miss it if if the spiritual man doesn't open up your eyes to it. You remember what we looked at Sunday morning. The natural man doesn't pick up on these things. So you sit here and say, man, this Bible doesn't make any sense to me. What you're saying, according to the Bible, is I'm lost and on my way to hell. Because this is God's book right here. And it's God's spirit that reveals those things to you. The more you're in it, the more you try, the more you pray, the more you study, the more it'll make sense. But when you say all oh, the Bible, it's just fairy tales, it's just boring, it's just you're either lost on your way to hell or you're so backslidden, you're walking in the natural man and you just aren't in touch with God. And so the more we get in touch with God, the more he opens this up to us. Amen. So let's pray together in a minute here and ask God to allow us to be in touch with him tonight and to show us some things. Let's start reading. Revelation chapter 9, verse number 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his, hath his name Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, when they, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, for to slay a third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. And out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire, and by the smoke, and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. Now see, fire and brimstone is not just some hillbilly in North Carolina. And it's not just some outdated, ah, fire and brimstone preacher. It's Bible. Now look at this. Verse number 19. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents that, and had heads. And with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of their works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Let's pray. Father, tonight I come before you, truly thankful to be in the house of God on a Wednesday night, Lord, to be here in church. And Lord, just thinking on my way here, how how wonderful that is, listening to that song, Lord, that I feel a presence in this place. And Where you promised, Lord, Jesus Christ said it himself, where two or more gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. What a joy. Father, I thank you for how these last few weeks we've felt your presence in this church. We've seen you bring visitors in steadily. and We've seen hands go up, Lord, at the invitation that they don't know Christ as their Savior. And Father, hearing back from those who brought them, saying that they're under conviction, Father, and they're concerned about their soul. They're concerned about whether or not they're going to heaven when they die. Lord, that just thrills my soul. And I thank you, Lord, for how you've been with us, how you've moved in our services, how you've touched hearts. And Father, tonight we truly need you. I mean, Lord, more than ever. God, I realize that without you, I can do nothing. Without you, this church can do nothing. And these people here tonight, Father, they need something from God. They're tired. They've been working this week and 
they've been busy and they've got lots of concerns and cares of this life that have them burdened down. And Lord, some are happy and some are uh, frustrated and unhappy. And Lord, there's just all kinds of different people sitting here. Father, there's nothing I can do. But I know your Holy Spirit can work and move and can touch hearts, can help people, can encourage people. And so, Lord, tonight I pray you do that. Pray that every person that's here would be glad that they came. <coughs> I pray that you open up the Word of God to them. Open our eyes, Lord, that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Father, if there's anybody here that's lost and on their way to hell does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, God, that's the most important thing. It would thrill my soul, Lord, if you'd let me lead somebody to Christ before we leave here tonight. Help them to realize their need for Jesus Christ, especially, Lord, looking at what we're looking at here. What a scary thing it is. I pray the Holy Spirit would make it real to them. That they'd realize, Father, how powerful this book is. I ask you, Lord, to give us wisdom and understanding in these things. And I pray you'd apply it to our hearts to strengthen us spiritually and help us to be a people grounded in the Word of God. Strengthen our faith now in this book, we pray in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. All right, now last Sunday we stopped here at verse number 11, and I want to draw your attention to something. And I, I find it quite interesting because this Bible, this, this Bible in front of you will shed light on so much that goes on around you, especially when it comes to religion. You really want to expose the fallacies of religion. All you need is a Bible, that's it. And it's amazing what this Bible will do. Now look at verse number 11, and I want you to notice something. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Now, what caught my attention there is Hebrew and Greek are listed in the same verse. You know what I find interesting about that? Almost all scholars in in the last few years, it hasn't been for a real long time, it's been the last hundred years or so, have had this growing love for the quote-unquote original languages. It used to be a guy would have a Bible, he knew that was the Word of God, he would set out with a Bible and faith in God and a hymn book, and that's it, and go see God do amazing things through the preaching of the Word of God. That was it. Childlike faith, just like Jesus said, in God's Word. And they had one Bible in the English language, and that was just all they had. And now, with the advent in America of this love for knowledge, and this lust for power, which is what it boils down to, and this infatuation with education, that influence of the world seeped into the church. And so now you've got Bible colleges and seminaries that are all about higher education. And they even have what they call textual criticism. And what they do is they take the Bible that we had for 400 years in the English language, that sparked revivals all around this world, that saw millions of souls come to Christ. They take that one Bible and they say, wait a minute, it's kind of getting outdated. It's kind of hard to understand. Read Revelation if you think the Bible's Not hard to understand. Look at this. We need a new version that will be easier to understand. Now, everybody sits back and says, yeah, we don't use all those words anymore. Yeah, that makes sense. You're right. So, what do we do about making a new version? Oh, well, what was this translated from? It was translated from the Greek and it was translated from the Hebrew, right? Okay, so we got to go back to the Greek and we got to go back to the Hebrew to retranslate one. Now that's easier for us to understand. And what they successfully have done in the last hundred years plus is they've taken the Bible you had in your hands that you studied so you could know God. You understand that? You get that, right? I mean, you open the Bible first to find out where you were going when you die, didn't you? Haven't you? Have you done that? That's the most important question in all the planet, is where am I going when I die? You have nothing else to live for, nothing else to worry about, nothing else to consider. Your job doesn't matter, your health care doesn't matter. Nothing matters until you settle that one question of where am I going when I die, and give me a Bible to show me, please, because I really don't care what religion says. There's too many of them. Right? You want to trust me? (laughs) You don't know me from Adam. How do you know I don't have an angle? So show me. So you started with show me from the Bible how to be saved. 
then from there, what's the Bible for? It is for you to draw closer to Jesus Christ. It is for you, now that you're a Christian, to know more about your Savior. And then as you learn more about your Savior, He changes you from the inside out. And as He changes you from the inside out, your decision-making process changed. We saw that Sunday afternoon as we finished up 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. My decision-making process has changed because I'm saved and I'm getting to know Jesus Christ better as I study him in the Bible. You get the point? It's really simple. This is your lifeline, not only to your eternity in heaven, but secondly, to being ready to see Jesus Christ, which we're going to look at Sunday morning. This is it. So your adversary, the devil, just like we showed you ladies on Sunday afternoon, we were talking about women do matter. We were showing you how the devil hates you. Well, your adversary, the devil, hates you, and he also, and more than he hates you, he hates the word of God. Because how he got at Eve was what? Yea, if God said. You know what I find interesting about the devil? He never tries to say God didn't speak. Why doesn't the devil say, there is no religion, forget it? That's what man does as he tries to educate people out of conviction. Oh, there is no God. But the devil's never worked over there. Where the devil works is in religion. Give them just enough Jesus so they feel okay, but don't give them the right one. And and we've been looking at that all the way through Revelation, folks. He copycats everything God does just to get you close enough to the truth to damn your soul. Oh, they got saved. I don't have the soul anymore. So get them close enough to this truth to stunt their spiritual growth so you can get control over that life. And they never accomplish what God has for them to accomplish. And that is being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. It's a genius plan. The problem is, the Christians have bought into it. And now you've got all these people obsessed with higher education, obsessed with the originals, obsessed with Greek and Hebrew. Now, let me just blow through the smoke screen because we've got to get moving here or we'll be here all night. I want to just blow through some things and just tell you the truth. There is no such thing as an original anywhere on the planet today. When they say they have the originals, they are lying. How long do you think a piece of paper would last? Any original that was penned down is when Paul was actually writing that letter. Those are gone. They rotted. It's been 2,000 years. You think they're going to last that long? With 2,000-year-old technology and on how to preserve things? They can preserve your food better today. Amen. With the chemicals they got, than they could ever preserve a book or a piece of paper back then. It's impossible. And if we went into manuscript evidence and showed you how they wrote and what kind of paper they wrote on all that stuff, you would just be like, wow, it's ridiculous that we would anybody would ever say the originals. Now, I have a copy of the Texas Receptus, the received text in my office. I took the classes on it. I took the Greek. I did not come to these conclusions just because my preacher told me and I like him and I think he's smart. I actually took the classes. I paid the money. I tried to learn the Greek, the Greek so that I would know whether or not I got the truth. Can I tell you the truth? It doesn't shed any light on the Bible you got in front of you. None at all. Every time in class, my teacher would say, now look at what that says in the Greek. And we'd look. He'd say, what's the definition of that word? We'd, we'd quote it. He'd say, is that a, a nugget? Is that amazing? Praise the Lord. Is that amazing? And I'd say, doesn't, isn't that exactly what it says here in the English? Just ask him. You guys, it shed no light at all whatsoever. So when you say the Greek, the originals, they're lying. They don't have a copy of an original. Actually, they got copies of copies of copies of copies. Then they try to tell you another argument. The oldest is best. So the oldest manuscript we can find is therefore the closest to the original. Well, the oldest manuscript they found was one that was stuffed away in the Vatican that was not used. You know why it was stuffed away in the Vatican and wasn't used? Because it was a piece of garbage. And they discarded it. They ignored it. And it wasn't propagated and it wasn't spread. What does God do with his word as we went through the book of Acts? What did we figure out? God multiplies the word, doesn't he? He gets it out to people. He doesn't lock it up in some pope or some priest's office so nobody can get to it. And the one they found in the Vatican that now they're writing all the new Bibles from is the biggest piece of trash you ever met in your life. It cuts out so much essential doctrine from the Bible. It's got to be of the devil. So they lie to you when they say you've got to have the originals. Now, I want to I just kind of run through these things because 
If I get down this track, I'll park it here all night because this is a very subject I'm very passionate about. So all I have in front of me is the Bible, right? I got my King James Bible. That's all I've got, okay? We didn't, we're not going to go get a seminary degree. Or you you want to go get a seminary degree? I don't. Let's look at the Word of God and find out from the Bible what the Bible has to say about those subjects. Look back with me at Luke 23. I'll show you something very interesting. Luke chapter number 23. Very interesting. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. You know what they were doing here? They were crucifying Jesus Christ. Isn't that kind of interesting? Now, now let me stop for a second. When the Old Testament was originally written, it was the perfect word of God. The Hebrew Masoretic text. I don't have an argument against the Hebrew Masoretic text. It was the word of God for that day. That's not my enemy. You can't be a Bible believer and say anything good about the originals. Why not, man? They were an inspired word of God. What are you scared of? Have to have a brain, okay? When the New Testament was originally written, it was written in the Koine Greek, the the Texas Receptus, which means the received text. The masses of people received it and recognized it as the Word of God. It was written in Koine Greek, which was the common language of the day, not the classical Greek literature that the Bible correctors always want to run to. It was written in the common man's language, just like the book in your lap. So everybody could have it, everybody could read it. Now, I'm not against the Texas Receptus. It was the Word of God. You know what I am against? I am against somebody who believes that God could take a Bible, inspire that Bible, and put it down on this earth perfect, but then couldn't preserve that same Bible. Why would you say one miracle is possible, but the other miracle is not? So in other words, if it's impossible for God to give me a perfect book, although there's all kinds of promises in the Bible that God was going to preserve his word perfectly all through the Bible. God promised you he'd preserve his words and you'd have his words. And we say, yes, we see that. But what God really meant was in the originals and since they're copies of copies, it's impossible for God to give us a perfect book today. Why, that's awful hypocritical, isn't it? You don't believe in miracles? What happened when you got saved? A miracle. (laughs) You were born again by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit came into you and indwelt you. The circumcision made without hands. It's a miracle when you get saved. So why do we say God couldn't preserve a perfect book? And if God can preserve a perfect book, then to undermine people's faith in God's word by saying we need the originals, the Greek and Hebrew, is awfully hypocritical because you're undermining their faith in the book they've got. What do you do? You pull the Bible out of the people's laps and you set up the preachers, the, the, the PhDs, the, the clergy as an authority over the people where you've got to come to me to find out what he said. You can't go to him yourself. You understand what's going on here? It's a trick of the devil. Amen. Now, so, I'm not against the Greek. I'm not against the Hebrew. I'm against combining the two to attack what you have today. Does that make sense? Now, if I'm going to build my argument right from my Bible, what does the Bible say in Luke? Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. The only verses where the three of them show up or the two of them show up in the same verse, something very bad is happening. Not very good. Here they're crucifying the Lord. Go to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. I'll show you another verse. I want you to understand, I'm not trying to vilify the originals. I mean, that would be stupid. <laughs> that was, God was inspiring his word, right? So why is that? Why would we say they're wicked? What I'm trying to show you is once you've got the revelation of God in your lap, don't run back to something that's dead and gone to correct what you've got. When really you don't have the original anyhow. And if God worked a miracle there, why don't we trust him to work one here? Let's see if God worked a miracle here. What does God say about those languages when they're put together in modern context? This title then read, uh, uh, 1920. This title read, uh, then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city and it was written in Hebrew and Greek 
and Latin. Again, they're crucifying Christ and they give you those three languages. The Catholic Church uses Latin to tell you that, well, what that originally means is, well, the, what the Greek actually really means, what the Hebrew actually really means. You know what they're doing? They're crucifying Christ again. Because when you come with the Bibles that they get from those quote-unquote originals, they drop the name of Jesus Christ. They drop all kinds of essential doctrine. They cut out all kinds of the words of Christ in red that they supposedly worship so much. They're lying to you. They've been deceived. And they've been deceived by the one who hates the word of God. And back at the beginning of Genesis chapter 3, he said, Yea, hath God said. He didn't say God never spoke. He didn't say there is no inspired Bible. He said, yeah, did God really say just that? And then he took what God said and just switched it around a little bit. God said, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. God said, go get them, guys. One tree don't touch. Now, that's a positive message, isn't it? You know what the devil said? Did he say you can't eat of every tree of the garden? Man, is that slick. Is that slick or what? You know what that is? That's salesman psychology, brother. You want to get them to buy? You give them a negative attitude towards their current their current vendor. Just a little bit of a just a little doubt in their current vendor's character. Just a little doubt in what they currently got. Just make them a little unhappy with what they just a little unhappy with what they said, and you can turn a big sale, man. That's manipulation, and that's exactly what that sucker's been doing since the Garden of Eden. To mankind. And that's when he attacked the woman and that's how he did it. You know what people don't like today? They don't like dogmatic authority. They don't like somebody getting up and saying, the Bible says and God said and that's it. It's in black and white. They say, well, that's your interpretation. Well, the Bible says no prophecy of scriptures of, of any private interpretation. So how do you like that? I'm not here to interpret it. I'm here to read it, believe it, and preach it. That's what it says. Who are you to tell me? I'm nobody. I don't like it any more than you do. You think my flesh loves that, you know, uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. <laughs> Proof that I'm going to die is that I'm getting old. You think I like that? That's what it says. It's not for us to like. It's for us to believe. People don't like this book and the devil knows you don't like it. And so you know what he'll do? He'll give you a good line. And that good line is, well, it's just a copy. So how do you know it's the perfect Word of God? We need to go back to the originals. You know what people have done then? They've just pretty much quit reading their Bibles. They don't even carry them to church anymore. If you didn't carry it today, I wasn't doing a, you know, I'm not the Bible police. I wasn't doing a check. If you've got something besides the King James Bible, knock yourself out. Would you really say, yeah, knock yourself out? It doesn't intimidate me a bit. You know what, you, you carry it, keep carrying it. Before long, as you watch us preach verse by verse through the Bible, and I make points that are proven by other places, passages of Scripture, and you realize that word's not in there, you're going to get convinced, man. You're going to get convinced. Truth is never intimidated by error. All right? Revelation chapter 9. So what comes up out of the pit? The king, which is over them. And it's funny to me that when they name him, They give him a Hebrew name and they give him a Greek name. God's trying to tell us in the end times something, folks. And the end time church has become infatuated with Greek and Hebrew and blah, 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 and just hate the word of God, undermine the word of God. And when that king comes up out of that pit, he's got a Hebrew name and a Greek name. Can I just make this one last point on this subject? in reference to the Bible, and then I'll show you who this guy is. The Word of God is not dead, right? It's alive. The Word of God is not bound. The Koine Greek, the Texas Receptus I have in my office, the Koine Greek is a dead language spoken nowhere on the planet today. You know what they tell you? They say God locked His Word into time. But when I say, well, isn't that a dead language? Yeah, where is that spoken anywhere on the planet today? It's not. Okay, wait a minute. 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. Plus 4 plus 4 is 8. 8 and 8 is 16. 16 16 is 32. 32 and 32 is 64. I mean, I could keep going, but I'm not going to. It's just like that simple, okay? Koine Greek is a dead language. God's Word is alive. The King James Bible needs to be rewritten because there's some words in it we don't use anymore. I can show you some most of you have used today. And you get real mad if I use them from the pulpit, but you use them. 
They're still in there. Amen. <laughs> I'm in a mischievous mood. Can you tell? I'm trying to walk in the spirit and be good this tonight. I really am trying to be good. Now, this is outdated. But we're going back to a Texas receptus text that's not spoken anywhere on the planet today. Do you see the compromise in that? Do you see the hypocrisy? That's a dead language that you're correcting a living book with. I mean, it hasn't been it hasn't been eight days since I led somebody to Christ with this book. It's alive. It's still producing fruit. Isn't that neat? <laughs> now, this is alive. This is still spoken the vast majority. But wait a minute. People don't understand it. We've got to make it easier to understand. Why? Sunday morning, the natural man doesn't perceive the things of God. You've got carnal Christians today who got saved, get in a carnal church, never get in that Bible and study that Bible and grow spiritually. So they're stinking carnal and they don't understand the Bible. And they will be more than glad to pay you to write them something easier to understand, especially when that thing doesn't convict the conscience like this one does. I, would show you, I could show you things out of this Bible, folks, that blow your mind. PhDs in English grammar can show you stuff in this Bible you don't even know exist. <laughs> the way the words are written when God's talking about sinful things actually cut the conscience. Lasciviousness, fornication. They're aggressive and abrasive ways that the words are put together. The way the letters are stacked on each other. But wait, peace, joy, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, charity. They actually stroke the conscience. You know what you've got in front of you? A live book. The Word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing into this, dividing asunder soul and spirit, joints and morals, discerning the thoughts and incense of the heart. You read that Bible and something inside of you says, I don't like that when you're backslidden. Something inside of you says, that's repulsive when you're lost. It's alive. But they're saying that it's outdated, so we need to rewrite it. Oh, let's rewrite it with a dead language that's not spoken anywhere on the planet. Well, you know the Bible's not dead. Number two, the Word of God's not bound, is it? Buy the truth and sell it not, right? Cast thy bread upon the waters, right? You know what every Bible has besides the King James Bible? They have a copyright. They can copyright the notes in a King James Bible. So you look in the front of your Bible, you find a copyright. It's for the notes. But we can run off, I mean, Brother, Brother Josh ran off 5,000 copies of John and Romans for us and nobody's coming after him. That's God's word. If you've got nothing but the Bible, you can copy it and send it out. It's not bound, folks. But they say, oh, that, those original languages are locked in time. Languages change and those languages are locked in time. They're just lying to you and I'll be honest with you, they know they're lying. Now, let's look at this guy. We're not going to get through all my notes tonight, so I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to quit on time, even if it's abrupt and uncomfortable, okay? I'm just going to quit on time. How, how's that? Does that sound fair? I know it's Wednesday night. I know you're tired, and I thank you for being so good about coming. So let's look at how God feels about the originals. Go back to Genesis chapter 1 and look at verse number 1. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Look at verse 2. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Does anybody see a problem with that? I don't have a problem, but something's up. Because God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Right? In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Verse number 2. The earth is without form and void. God never did anything without form and go void. Everything God did was good. Do you know what you've got right there before you get two verses into the Bible? You've got more doctrine than 99% of the theologians can ever figure out. Two verses in. You know what happened, folks? And I'll just give you the quick rundown. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Satan was the anointed cherub that covereth. He rebelled. He said, I want your throne. God said, you're done. And smashed that original creation and sunk it. Remember what he said to Noah? I will never again destroy the earth with water. Now, we've been going through Acts and we've been going through Revelation. I've been showing you how God works in threes. God is going to destroy the earth again. We're going to see that in a few weeks in Revelation. But you know how he does it the next time? 
by fire. Why? Because he promised Noah I wouldn't do it again by water. Why did he promise him again? Because Noah knew this is the second time you've drowned in the world, God. And I'm scared. God said, relax, Noah, I'll never again do it by water. You know what you got right there? You got the original in verse number one. And by the time you get to verse number two, God has destroyed the original. And at verse number three, God starts recreating a second one. And God created it perfect and it wasn't under a curse. And in six literal days, God recreates the mess. You read the book of Job and you find out some of those passages over there when God said, Hitherto shall thy proud waves be stayed. You know what God did? He destroyed the pride of the devil and blocked that thing out and smashed him and sunk him and locked him up. And then stepped back and said, all right, we'll take care of this. Here's what we'll do. And recreated it. He gave you a second one. Isn't that wild? And you God works in threes. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you're a body, soul, a spirit. God works in threes. I could do it. I could do weeks worth of lessons of the imprint of the Godhead on the universe and show you threes all over around you. This, this Bible, yeah, man, this Bible is so far ahead of the smartest geniuses. It's just hysterical. It's just funny to listen to the scientists talk. It's funny. That's dumb and it's outdated and we got carbon dating that proves that the earth is more than 6,000 years old. Yeah, that's because you're a fool. I could have showed you that without paying thousands of dollars to go through school. I don't care if they prove anything. Couldn't care less. God's got it covered, man. I like it. Now, God destroys the first original. Go with me to Exodus chapter 31. I'll show you another one. I mean, you guys realize how every one of these, we're just kind of scratching at the surface. Every one of these subjects, I mean, boy, we can just get, I'm having fun tonight. I don't know about you, but I'm having fun. Some of you look like you're having a good nap. I praise the Lord for that. I, I think what's a great marketing tool. Come to our church. We provide a wonderful sleeping environment. Amen. All right. We were joking around on the roof and I said, with Reagan Roofing, we offer a guarantee. If your roof leaks, we'll buy you an umbrella couch. Amen. All right. Exodus chapter 31. Look at verse 18. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of the communing with him upon Mount Sinai. Now watch. Two tables of testimony. Tables of stone. Now, interesting. Watch this. Written how? There's got to be more than two of you here tonight. How is it written? God wrote on that table of stone with his finger, man. Is that cool or what? Wouldn't you like that? That's like that original that Paul was sitting there writing. It would be cool to see one of those. Wouldn't it? Like, wow, he had horrible handwriting. That's got to be the one he wrote with his own hand. (laughs) You know, wouldn't that be cool? Now watch what happens. Interestingly enough, look at chapter 32, verse 16. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. And he said, see, the old man knew what was going on. The kid had the wrong perspective, but the old man knew what was happening. And he knew because he was closer to God. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome. So he knows. He's heard it before. He's been around a little bit. And he's been around with God, so he's got some discernment. He knew what was happening. God already told him. But the noise of them that sing do I hear. So it had to be something like a rock concert because it sounded like a war. It had to be that, those drums and that aggressiveness, and that. but they were partying, you know, kind of like a mosh pit. I'm telling you, God's just always ahead. Now look at verse 19. And it came to pass as soon as he came that year, the Pastor, he's not supposed to know those exist. And it came to pass... <laughs> And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger waxed hot. You're not supposed to ever get angry. Well, Moses did and so did Jesus. And he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. You know what happened to the original? God let it get destroyed. Now watch. Go to Exodus 34. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount. 
Neither let the flocks nor the herds feed before that mountain. So God says, all right, come up. I'm going to give you the words again. Now go to chapter, verse number 27. Verse 27, chapter 34. And the Lord said unto Moses, write who? Well, men wrote the Bible. Duh. <laughs> I'm not trying to be mean, you guys, but really? Duh. You're a genius. I mean, really, we're going to argue this. I'm going to waste a lot of time sitting here arguing with you right now when that's your argument against God. That's very uneducated and bigoted and closed-minded. And I do use those arguments when I run into people that are like that. I pray for discernment when to and when not to, but I do. I just say, well, that's awfully bigoted, don't you think? What do you mean? Well, you're just being closed-minded, aren't you? Why would you say that? (laughs) Because you're just going with what you think and you're not letting me spell out my argument. You're being closed-minded. I love using liberal terminology on the liberals themselves. It's great. Now watch. I'm going to chase that rabbit because I'm having fun, but it's a rabbit. Let's stay on point. Right now these words, after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. You know what you've got? A copy. You guys, I could go on and on and on. Let's look at this last one. Go to Jeremiah chapter 36. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Find Isaiah. Keep going a little bit to your right. Jeremiah chapter 36. I want to show you this one. What I'm trying to do tonight is show you the devil hates your Bible. And he hates it so much that the king of the bottomless pit is named after the two languages that are used today to destroy your Bible. Say, why is it, why are you making such a big deal out of this, preacher? Because I think it has everything to do with end times. I think it has everything to do with the coming tribulation. I really do. I really do. This is a new rise and an attack on the Word of God. And I think we need to know this is the way we grow, people. This is the way we win souls. The devil hates that book. Jeremiah chapter 36, look at verse 4. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, I like to call him Barak, the son of Neriah, <laughs> And Barak wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord. Wouldn't that be hysterical if the God called him right up front when we get to the judgment and just says, all right, I want you to stand up here and tell everybody why all your policies were wrong and quote the scripture that proves you were wrong before I send you where you're going. That'd be great. All right, anyways, that's another rabbit. And Barak wrote from the mouth of the Lord all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him upon a rule of a book. Got it? Okay, pretty easy, right? Now, Jeremiah 36, 32. Let me tell you the story just for time's sake. This book is taken in. It's read before the king. Jehudai takes his pen knife. And you can read the chapter later. He takes his pen knife. Very interesting that the King James Bible uses the word pen knife. And he cuts it up and throws it in the fire. That's what the scholars do today. They use their writings, their pen, to cut out the word of God. Cut that word out. Cut that word out. I don't like that word. I don't like that word. And they cut it out. He used a pen knife to cut up the word of God and throw it in the fire. So you know what God does? What am I going to do? The originals are gone. How am I ever going to get my word to everybody? God doesn't worry about that stuff. Because he's God. So the Greek language is dead. So the Hebrew Masoretic is dead. So what? Isn't that great? God's on the throne. Look at verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another rule and gave it unto Baruch, the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words with Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire. And now watch this. And there were added besides unto them many like words. You know why God said that? God said that because one of the biggest arguments against the King James Bible today is, do you see those italicized words? Let's find one in the chapter here. I I hadn't uh, planned on pointing one out, but uh, look at verse 18. And I wrote them with ink in the book. You see that word them? It's in italics. Look at verse 22. And there was a fire. There was a fire is all in italics on the hearth. You see that? You know why those words are in italics? Because they weren't in the originals. When you wrote in Hebrew, Jeremiah 36, you didn't have to fill those words in because the language, it, it made the same sense. It made sense. When the King James translators were translating your Bible... They were so honest, anything that wasn't word for word from the original, they put in italics so you'd know this wasn't in the original. 
Oh, then those must not be inspired. No, wait a minute. If God's God, he can add to his book anytime he wants. There's a law on on the books right now in the States. The author can add to their own writings, but you can't. You'll be sued. He can add any time he wants to add. So there were added unto them many like words. You know what's interesting about that? When they attack the King James Bible and the King James translators, and King James himself, they say he's a homosexual and all that stuff, which is all a lie. I really want to prove that, but I'm not going to right now. i, I got to stay on track. So, when they want to disprove that Bible, they say, see those italicized words? Can I ask you a question? Why don't those stinking hypocrites, those stinking liars, I mean, it just boils my blood, man. Why don't those stinking liars italicize the words in their Bibles that don't match the originals? You know what I got in front of me? I got an ethical book. I got a book that was done in honesty. Have you read Proverbs? See what God says about a man who's upright? There were some upright men writing that thing. And they wanted you to know this wasn't in there. But you know what God was doing? God was preserving his word perfectly. I mean perfectly You know what this is right here? It's a miracle. You know what God did every time the originals were destroyed? God gave them a replacement. And if I really wanted to get crazy, I'd show you how the translations were always better than the originals, but we're not going there tonight. As you get closer to the end times, God Almighty gave you a perfect book right here, and you know you got it, and I only have, I don't even have half of my ammo out there. There is so much more I could show you folks. Common sense alone. Without Greek, without Hebrew, without manuscript evidence, without archaeology, without any of that stuff, common sense alone will prove the point. You can back it up with all the other stuff if you want to waste your time. You know what you got right here? A perfect book. Now, go with me if you would to John chapter 8. I want to show you one more thing tonight and we'll be done. John chapter number 8. It's going to to turn to a few verses here to prove the point though, all right? Now, I showed you already the the Hebrew and the Greek name Abaddon and Apollyon. Judas Iscariot. You guys know the name, right? How many of you realize that's a Hebrew and a Greek name put together? (laughs) That's a deep book you got in front of you. John chapter number 8, look at verse number 44. You are of your father the devil, the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. You see that? Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. You know what you're talking about right there? You're talking about the devil, man. Abaddon and Apollyon. It means the destroyer. That's what that name means. He's a destroyer. You know who was a murderer from the beginning? The devil. You know, the name Judas is the Greek rendering. It means, it means praised. The devil's always wanted worship. Always has. It means praised. But Iscariot is a Hebrew name, and it means a man of murder. A hireling. Well, he's the father of his father, the devil. Now, go to John chapter 10. Look at verse 12. Now remember, Judas Iscariot. Judas means praised. Iscariot means a man of murder, a hireling. Judas is Greek. Iscariot is Hebrew. Now watch. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Abaddon Apollyon, he's the destroyer. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Thank God for Jesus Christ, man. What the devil wrecked, Jesus fixed. (laughs) Ain't that good? I'm the good shepherd. And the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. Now, go to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. I'm going to put the picture together here for you in a minute. John chapter 17. Look at verse 12. While I was with them in the world... I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Notice that name, son of perdition. Well, who is he talking about? You know who that is, right? None of them is lost. He kept them all but what? 
but one. He said, I have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil, right? Judas Iscariot, the Greek Hebrew name, the praised murderer and hireling. He's always seeking worship and praise. That's why we say he works in churches more than he works in the world. Down at the bar, the flesh will take care of that mess. The, the, the street walkers, the flesh takes care of that mess. He doesn't, you don't need help on that. <laughs> Nine times out of ten men, ladies, when you're tempted with fleshly sins, it's you, not the devil. Oh, the devil's giving me a hard time. No, you're wicked. <laughs> Amen. He's a lot smoother and slicker and more polished and professional than that. Are you kidding me? I'm not saying he doesn't use lust of the flesh and things like that to destroy you. I'm just saying a lot of times we blame him for stuff when he's working other ways. Now, son of perdition. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, we know that's talking about Judas Iscariot. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Boy, we are seeing that, friends. I mean, we've never seen it like we're seeing it now. The United States has seen it bad. But it's all over the world. That the man of sin, oh boy, might be revealed. Now watch, the son of perdition. You know who that is? That's the man of sin. Who's the man of sin? That's the Antichrist as he's going to be revealed to the world in the tribulation period. Is that scary stuff or what? You know who he is? Judas Iscariot. <laughs> wow. Look at verse 4, who opposeth himself, opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Judas praised. He wants the praise that God gets. Iscariot, the murdering hireling. That's him. You know where he's at right now? He's locked up. The devil has an unholy trinity. I told you he copycats everything God does. God had Hebrew and Greek originals. The devil's got a Hebrew and a Greek name. He copycats everything God does. And his spirit that works in these last days, the spirit of the Antichrist that is already in the world, the spirit of the devil that's been working for a little over a hundred years, undermining the yea hath God said trying to take the Bible away from the people so that the falling away will come because he's the destroyer. He can't wait for his day when he gets to let loose on this earth. And he's been pulling that Bible away with Greek and Hebrew. Is that crazy or what? When God destroys the original, don't try to resurrect it. God knows what he's doing. People have the, the, the table that God wrote on. You know what they'd be doing? You know what foolish people would be doing? God's finger touched this rock. Look at God. They'd be praying to that God. They'd make an idol out of it, man. The Pope would have it locked up somewhere and charge people a lot of money to come kiss it. Amen. Go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Look at verse 25. That he might take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. Judas, the praised murderer and hireling, is a king. And he's got a place that he owns. It's his own place. He's the king of the bottomless pit. The Hebrew and Greek name of Abaddon and Apollyon. The destroyer. That's him, guys. I mean, you get, you, it's all over the Bible. Watch this. Go, to, go with me to, to uh, John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Just a couple more references here and I'll quit. John chapter 13. <clears throat> Look at verse 26. Well, let's back up a second. Go to verse 23. 
There's two different kinds of disciples. <laughs> Which one are you? That's a good question. Amen. Now, there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. So, John's there with his ear on the heartbeat of eternity. And Simon Peter's standing back there looking and he goes, Hey, John, tell him, ask him, ask him. And he lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a... See the word? Do you see the word? Are you getting it? Son of perdition. When I have dipped it, and when he had dipped the sop, son of perdition, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Do that with a Greek Texas Receptus. You know who the son of perdition is? It's Judas Iscariot. I already showed you the verses. And he handed him a sop. <laughs> is he awesome or what? I mean, he created the world. Do you get that? If you don't get it, just send up a Jeremiah right now. Or a Nehemiah, or whatever it is. Send one up quick. Lord, help me. Show me that. What's he talking about? He handed him a sop. I'm just telling you guys. You read your Bible and you go, this is boring. Oh, no, it's not. Oh, no. I think that's a thousand years of our, yeah, a thousand years of our existence. Well, maybe not the best. I don't know, but probably up there. It's going to be that millennial kingdom where we get to learn and learn and learn and learn that book for a thousand years. It's amazing. And we're just, we're just kind of picking at the surface like, I wonder. And then we can sit back and argue. And, well, did you ever see that verse? It doesn't that thing. Guys, this is an amazing book in front of you. It's amazing. Go over with me if you would. Uh, oh, by the way, we're in John chapter 13. What's 13 the number of? I've told you before. Rebellion. Right? It's the number of rebellion. You're in John chapter 13. The chapter and verse markings aren't inspired. My, you're awfully unstudious for somebody of such a high IQ. All right. I, I'm, I just, I'm sick of it, guys. I'm, I'm, t- I'm sorry. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of people coming to church for five years at Bible Believers and then, and then going somewhere where they don't even believe the Bible. I'm tired of it. I mean, if you, if you don't get the point after all that time, what, what am I going to say other than, you know, one walked with Jesus for three years and still didn't get it, so, you know, who am I? Amen. I mean, really, I say that humbly. Who am I? So, but, but I'm sick of it. When the church, when you look up what the church believes and they say on their website, the, the, we believe the inspiration in the original autographs, they're telling you we don't believe there's a perfect Bible anywhere on the planet today. That's what they're saying. And so if there's not a perfect Bible anywhere on the planet today, how do I know that the part that's not off isn't John 3.16? So how do I know I'm even going to heaven? How do I know the Muslims aren't right? Fuck and load, guys. Jihad. <laughs> I'm, serious. I'm serious, though. I mean, really think, man. People don't think. You realize people just don't think. They believe, oh, I'm not as smart as him, and I don't have his degree, so I'm just going to, I feel stupid around him. I don't have to be stupid. If I got God, and I got his book, and I got a brain, and I got the Holy Spirit, and he can show me stuff, praise the Lord, man. It's cool. Hallelujah. John chapter 13. Okay. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I think I lied to you a minute ago. I, I think we're going to look at two more, two more, three more texts, and, I'll, and I will, we'll be done here. But I'm going, to, I'm going to have you get Revelation 13 in a minute and the book of John, and we'll be done, okay? I, I don't want to wear you out with turning. I know that it gets old, but I want you to see this stuff. Oh, we already looked at this one, the son of perdition. John 13, there it is again, that the man of sin be revealed, the SOP, son of perdition. That's what I was going to point that one out. I'm sorry I wasted your time there. Turn to Revelation 13. Get that in one hand, please. Revelation 13 in one hand. And uh, John chapter 6 in the other. John chapter 6. <clears throat> now, what I'm trying to do tonight, what I'm trying to do tonight is I'm trying to strengthen your faith in the book in your lap. That's all I'm trying to get done. Nothing else. 
show you this stuff about the Antichrist, and that's great. If you can point him out and nail it down and all that stuff, that's good. But that doesn't really help you be a better husband or a better wife, right? Does it? Not really. But it's great. It's exciting to learn the Bible. What will help you be a better husband, better wife, is having confidence in that book in front of you, that it's the Word of God, and knowing you believe it, and going home and reading it, because your faith has been strengthened in it. Amen? So that's the moral of the story tonight. I'll just give you the invitation now. All right, now, look at John 13, verse 18. Here is wisdom. What a statement, huh? Now, hold the phone. What's 13 the number of? Rebellion. What I show you in John chapter 13. The sop being delivered to the son of perdition, to Judas Iscariot, the rebel. Now, here's wisdom. So when a guy tells you that that book in front of you is not perfect, he's a fool. He's got no wisdom from God. We've been looking at it on Sunday morning. There's wisdom of the world and there's wisdom of God. Two different kinds of wisdom. Now watch. Let him that understandeth. Wait a minute. When they don't get this stuff, they don't have understanding. Count the number of the beast. And then he tells you. For it is the number of a man. Well, what's the number of man? Six, right? And his number is six hundred, three score, and six. A score is twenty. So three score is sixty. Twenty, twenty, and twenty is sixty, right? Six hundred, three score, and six. Six, six, six is the mark of the beast. What verse are you in? In Revelation 13, which is the number of rebellion. How do you get to 18 if you're going to do simple math? Broke down in three is the way God works. Six plus six plus six. And they say the chapter and verse markings were inserted by a man later. You guys, it moves me to tears how amazing this book is. Oh, you can do that with any book. Are you kidding me? I will give you a Quran. I'll give you a Book of Mormon. I will give you an NIV. I'll give you a New World Translation. I'll give you the Watchtower magazine. I'll give you a track and field. I, do it. Do it. Do it. I'm serious. You, you, people say that stuff all the time. Like, oh, you can do that with any book. Well, then do it. Don't just say you can do that with any book. Show, I'm showing you. Show me in another book. Can't do it. Can't be done. John chapter 6. What's 6 the number of? Look at verse number 66. <laughs> it just gets funny after a while. When people don't believe the Bible, it's just funny. Look at verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. What the hireling did? He took off. Now verse number 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. In John chapter 6, verse number 66, they turned their back on Jesus and walked away. The spirit of Antichrist. They were going against him. They were going the opposite direction. Is this an amazing book or what? Don't you got in front of you guys the perfect, inerrant, infallible, inspired words of God? So isn't that nice to know you don't have to worry about, well, I wonder what Pastor Mike thinks of that. Open up the Bible and pray. Get your answers. Build your family. Build your marriage. Build your children. On this book. You got it. You got it. Lord, where shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Verse 69. Let's close with that. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if somebody hasn't... Listen, when I say that, let me say it like this. You need to understand. Give me 60 seconds. And listen, please listen. 60 seconds. Time me. Somebody time me. I'm going to do it this time. You got to stop watching. No. See? That's, it's a good church when they won't. Nobody will take me up on that. I love you guys. Now listen, seriously. If somebody has never opened up the Bible and taken you from this verse to this verse to that verse and showed you in the Bible 
how to get from here to heaven. Say it a little more directly. Where you're going when you die. And if you can't open a Bible and say, I am going to heaven because what this said. Somebody showed me in a Bible where I was going. And from the Bible, they showed me how not to go there anymore. Then honestly, how do you, how can you say with any confidence at all that you're not going to hell? If nobody's ever showed you from a Bible. He said, where shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And the very next verse after that, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. See the confidence he had from the words? You know what the words do? Oh, you just believe the King James Bible. No, no, no. You know what the words do? The words help me believe on Jesus Christ with confidence. I am 100% sure that if I fell over here right now and dropped dead, I'd go to heaven and not hell. Oh, you really think you're something? No, I'm a wicked sinner. But somebody showed me from the words of God what the Bible says about my soul. And Christian, if you're saved, this is Jesus. It's how you get to know him. It's how you grow in him. Let's pray. Father, we love you. I pray if anybody's here tonight and not sure of where they're going when they die, Lord, no matter what their experience is, no matter what their church background, no matter what's happened to them in their life, all that junk aside, God, if they've never seen from the Bible where they're going when they die, help them to just stop me before they leave tonight, Lord, and say, hey, I want to know. And Lord, give us a chance to show them. For the Christians that are here, God, strengthen them in the Word of God. Build their faith. Bless them, I pray in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. Thank you for your attention, folks. You are dismissed.